me just kind of start my talk by, first of all, thanking the committee for awarding me this uh, lecture. I'm very honored to be here and to try to provide my own perspectives on, on welding engineering and my own profession, because uh, professors are egomaniacs. There would be a lot of me, me, me in this. John is smiling. Uh, anyway, but I also wanted to mention that Laterno University, in, t in terms of the panel discussion we had here, uh, I will try to uh, tackle some of the problems we handle or have to have to handle in undergraduate education. Now we have a master's program, so we kind of inch toward a graduate program. But since I've been at Laterno, we, our program actually tripled in size, and we have new facility technicians and all that. But we really hit uh, a, a number that we really need to push forward to higher numbers. I think we work really well with Ohio State and. Uh, with Ferris State, but I just wanted to remind you of one fact that uh, 16 years ago when I went to Laterno, there were several other programs that were out there, and they're no longer there. Uh, one was uh, the Arizona State program was shut down, the one in Texas A&M was shut down, uh, the one in Utah State kind of got dissolved. So we are on the threat, uh, so I'm not trying to make everybody feel paranoid, but we have very serious challenges at under, and welding engineering education, really. And that uh, we, we struggle, we try, to, we try to reach in every level to express our frustrations and try to do the best we can, but we struggle with the same issues. So anyway, uh, let me start by saying that uh, when I got this uh, award announcement, my wife passed away unexpectedly, uh, suddenly, almost a day. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to my wife's memory. Um, she always inspired herself from my welds, especially bad welds. She used to come with me. John might remember that she always came and uh, liked to hang out with, at, at the lab and uh, uh, look at things that she saw different things. She's been an artist. She is an artist. And this is what basically she looked at. Uh, we just actually started a show in Austin. We just have a new website for her. And this is what she looked at, electron beam welds. We can see the electron beam weld on the left that she actually turned into a triptych of some three characters. So I want to dedicate it because I could have never become a welder or a PhD without her because uh, she was along the way a great support, and I'll, I'll touch on that. So you will see slides that will basically interrupt some of my stories with her uh, artwork. The second person that I'd like to dedicate this talk is uh, Bill Kilhorn. Uh, you can see him. We goofed around a lot. He actually knighted me. You can see that picture with a big electrode. Well, that's Bill. Uh, we were we were goofing around. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough, as you know, he died earlier this year. Uh, we're very good friends, and his uh, his uh, expression used to be "not so fast, buddy," because <laughs> he always came in and he was overlapping. He always mentored me. So I have lots of people to recognize in this particular talk about me, 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 uh, the standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, here is Bill Kilhorn, definitely a giant that I recognize. So what I'm going to talk about my bio, uh, try to express my understanding of what professor is, uh, talk a little bit about the bit the controversial topic of education versus training, uh, theory versus practice, and engineering and engineering technology might not be very clear to people, as well as teaching versus research. and. Uh, Basically about myself. Uh, so here is my bio. I, uh, I went to a program, uh, the only program in Romania was uh, in, in existence since 1926 when they welded railroad tracks together, believe it or not, by flashbot welding. And I thought it was such a neat program. I, I tried to always emphasize to our potential students the uniqueness of a program. A unique always uh, attracts a certain category of people. And I was one of those guys. Uh, so I graduated. And that's when I started welding, and welded during the summers. And uh, I was in dif difficult places uh, welding uh, you know, overhead. I will ask one of uh, our visitors just walked in to share his experiences of why he thought that welding might be a great career until you're young. But then after a while, you might actually not want to be staying, uh, you know, laying on your, on your back and welding with, uh, without a with a mirror in your hand and with sparks flying all over the place. So it was a mixed message of things I learned during those summers. 
Uh, but then I worked in uh, manufacturing. Uh, I welded a lot there because they actually asked welding engineers to weld in pressure vessel manufacturing. After that, I went to Israel uh, and emigrated during, this is during communism. And I put a little star there to remind myself about the great experience I had as a welder as it started in capitalism, bottom up. Let's, let's experience what a welder does. So I did not tell the owners that I was a welding engineer. I was pretty good. I was better than all those people working there who were assembly, kind of picked up welding. So after the first week, they hated my guts, you know, because I was better than they were. And they were, they were, you know, Palestinian Israeli conflicts. There were Israeli Arabs there. And that was one of the guys who was probably six foot four and 250 pounds. And he held something in my hand. And I'm learning Hebrew. This is like first month of Hebrew, which is a very difficult language. Not only they write from right to left, but this is completely non un understandable. There were two words that I always confused down or lower, which is lemata, and up, which is lemala. Well, it's only one, one, one sound difference, right? So here's this Palestinian holding this axle and says, tack it right now, because I'm holding it, lemala. I go like, what is lemala? Is it up, is it down, it is up, is it down? And I'm thinking there and holding the gun. And he goes like, come on, come on, I'm going to smash this skull with this. So I picked up, and it was lemala, because I'm alive, still alive. So I picked the right one. This is how you learn languages, uh, by welding <laughs> and surviving. Uh, so anyway, just a thing to keep you entertained. I had several stories. Every, every place I, I welded, in, including certified in uh, uh, pulsed MIG welding of a 5000 series aluminum ship that actually was the first hydrofoil that went so fast that the Israeli Coast Guard didn't want it because it was going by 20 minutes by the coast and missing all the terrorists who were coming in on rowboats. So it really wasn't needed, but we built it anyway. Uh, then I worked in aerospace uh, aluminum mostly and advanced alloys, and then I came to grad school at Ohio State. My, my thesis was on building and actually operating a submerged TIG welding system that uh, some, of, some, some of the people here might remember. And then I worked at U.S. Steel Research uh, until 96, and I joined Letourneau uh, since then. So what's not in my bio is that I'm probably the best uh, trained military person in my welding engineers because I had to serve in the Army. So that's kind of left out of my bio, but I didn't do anything uh, welding related there. But I um, you know, fired really big guns and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I also have to confess the three years of management experience at U.S. Steel, but we won't talk about that because that's hush-hush. Uh, we won't talk about welding. So here are the mentors. At U.S. Steel, I had incredible, what kind of shoulders of giants I stand on. Dr. Barsom is still around, definitely. Capadia, Dr. Kim in corrosion, Dr. Mike Lack in, in tin plate and deformation, Repas, high, High temperature deformation of materials, manganello plate metallurgist, Al Redbone welding metallurgist. These guys were incredible. They taught me so much. And they always were so kind that when I came up with some stupid idea, they would never say it's a stupid idea. They just built into their answer an alternative, basically making me feel this small. But they were so kind to me. So they taught me an awful lot of things. And I, own, I worked in other materials besides. By the way, you might recognize the little sketch that my wife made. That's actually a Tekken test, a Y-groove test that is supposed to crack in the heat affected zone. Under, It's a self-restraining test, and that's how a single pass bead looks like. I did a lot of hydrogen-induced testing there. Then I had other giants, even my high school teacher. I still know as much physics as I knew in high school. I mean, people don't believe me, but I never picked up any more physics in college. We were so advanced back in Transylvania, believe it or not. Professor Schwartz was an incredible guy. And then I had all those names that you cannot pronounce, but Selajan has an interesting little connotation, just to give you an idea. Uh, Professor Selajan was one of, of our uh, process professors at, in, uh, in uh, Timisoara Polytechnic, which still is the best Romanian welding engineering school. and. Uh, when I was in grad school at Ohio State, they would, we were told that after Professor Clarence Jackson died, we, the graduate students, have access to his 
papers. Do you remember, John? Well, they, they gave, uh, his widow gave his entire library to, to Ohio State, and uh, the grad students could go in first. So I go down the basement, because that's where part of his library was, and I find heliographed papers. Remember heliographs? Anybody remember heliographs? You put them up to the sun, and they turn blue. That's why we have the word blueprints. This is before Xerox. A paper submitted by my professor in Timisoara, Romania, Professor Solajan, reviewed by Professor Clarence Jackson for publication in the Welding Journal. I felt that I arrived. You know, this is kind of a circle for me. So uh, I, I feel that without giving credit to the people that I call the shoulders of giants, it's just incredible. And I, I mentioned uh, the people at Technion. I, I almost finished my master's there. Incredible professors, especially Professor Rosen in high, high temperature deformation of materials, dislocation theory. And then, obviously, you, you see everybody here uh, from Dr. Bazelak and then Richardson and John Dippold is here. Thank you, John, for coming. And uh, it, it, it's been a pleasure being an, an, an alumnus at Ohio State. I, I really feel privileged to have gone there. I was, I think, number six to graduate uh, with a PhD in 1989. OK, so then my first question is, why am I, what's the Plummer Lectures about education? So let me tell you why did I you know, give up 40% of my income to go to Texas? because that was exactly how much pay cut I took. Which, by the way, my boss said, can I, match, can I, can I, can I make you, like, you know, stay? And I said, no, I'm going because I have a calling to be an educator. So he said, how much money did they give you? I said, 40% less that you pay me. He said, I can match that. <laughs> so number one, let's be, let's be honest. It was an opportunistic thing. There was a faculty opening. Bill Kilhorn retired. And then I really, really felt that I had a story to tell. Because a calling to fulfill, that sounds pretty bombastic. And yes, we all are uh, in this business. But truly, I, I, I taught two years at, at, uh, as an adjunct at Carnegie Mellon uh, in the evenings. And I got completely hooked to this incredible thing to see the lights come on in the eyes of the students. You know, that thing is like, like it's almost like a narcotic. I don't know if you guys agree with me. But when you see the lights come on, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and I also felt that I'm ready to give back to society. I, you call me an altruistic, you call me a liar, but I actually cost you, the taxpayers, almost $70,000 to do my PhD here because it was the Navy that paid for my PhD. And I felt uh, truly obligated to give back to society. I really did. And then I saw the lack of qualified welding engineers. I, st I still see it, and I think that's my topic is that we need more, fac more faculty at Laterna. We need more universities to, to crank out welding engineers. And also, I, I, I have to challenge this thing about the image of welding. I think the image will only change when the university level a little more freedom than you would think, because we are actually protected by tenure. Tenure actually became a really bad name, because it sounds like it's a job security for life. It was intentionally, in, initially intended to protect people from being fired for their beliefs. And I think that that's one of the things, I, I'm pretty sure that our president would fire me if he could, but that's a different thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we are the most expensive program on campus. We, we pay the highest insurance on the building. We are the most dangerous ones. We just had a transformer that is one 1,000 1, uh, kilovolt amps, so it's one megawatt transformer. Our transformer on the lab is bigger than what they need for the entire university. Well, what do you want? I mean, this is like a terrible program, but why don't they shut it down? Because our graduates get jobs, because we are making changes. But anyway, going back to my ability to profess, shape curriculum and, and, and transform lives. And then initiate sometimes unpopular areas of research especially when we changed the program name from, from welding engineering to material joining engineering in 2004. I got an awful lot of negative feedback, even from our alumni, because they thought that we're going to just become like a very up the up, nothing to do with reality program. And when they saw that our graduates are as good as they were before, 
I think that you will see an awful lot of what I believe slides from now on. So I think that it's kind of apropos that what, what we believe that practical experience can do to you, you can have a double-edged sword. You learn an awful lot, but at the same time, you know your limitations and you want to become a welding engineer. So. The other reason I'm here is to tell you about, this is a 10-year-old ten, consensus. I think uh, Jim is, Key is here. Thank you for coming, Jim. This is a 10-year-old census. I haven't looked at the new one. Is it a new one, Jim, besides the 2002, by the way? Do you remember the, the education census? I, I don't know if there's a new one, but I, uh, the, the, this, this motivated me for the plumber lecture, by the way. And I don't know if things have changed that much. I think the numbers have gone up. But the ratio between researcher, educators, engineers, and tech welders is really about the same. You cannot really see there, but it's 2% researchers, educators, 17% engineers, and 81% tech welders. And I think that ratio is pretty much stay the same. And I think that one thing that we, I think we need to do to change the essence of welding is to have more researchers, educators, and, and engineers. And the second thing that was kind of scary, it was a fairly good return. If out of 5,000, we got 348 back. And I'm not going to go through the, all this, but the, it was about size companies and demographics and all that. And the ones who were doubly degreed, this is the slide I want to show you. The academic background of the welding engineers was basically a very interesting. The blue one was 41% welding engineering. The rest were MEs, 21%, 11% uh, manufacturing engineers, and then uh, uh, E and other, and some materials engineers. That was OK. I think that if we have 41%, that's still not good. We should have more. But the scary thing was this. If you look at minimal graduation requirements to be called welding engineer, you can see that uh, about uh, high school is 11. Uh, BS in uh, non-welding engineering is 39, and only 30%, only 30% is the crosshatch area to the left. Only 30% of welding engineers are welding engineers who went to either Turn or, or Ohio State or other places. And I think that, that can, we can look at this in different ways. It might be wonderful that we have such a mix of people. We need diverse experiences. We need uh, uh, a multitude of talents. But at the same time, I think that it's also scary that we have people who don't even need a high school diploma to actually do welding engineering jobs, because it's a job uh, de definition. It's a, it's a title. It's really not a degree, re uh, so the degree requirement. So I think that that number that has to increase significantly, because in the last 16, 17 years, I've done enough consulting to see that incredible mistakes have been made by people who are actually are afraid to ask simple questions because they feel obligated because they have a double E degree or a mechanical engineering degree to ask questions. And I think that creates two different uh, uh, opportunities. Number one is to try to recruit more people to have welding engineering degrees. And second is to improve the training, which is I'm going to talk next about, to actually change those people's attitudes who actually know uh, only, say, robotics or materials, and they don't have a, uh, an overall understanding of designs, fracture mechanics, and other things to actually become more educated. So that was my reason to go to teach. So just kind of breaking with the, with the flow of thoughts, I just put in another drawing that actually uh, it was a chatting woman. It's actually heat affected zone uh, grain sizes that she actually decorated. I think it's pretty nice. So what do I believe about education and training? Well, education, according to the dictionary, it means to rear, to lead forth, to draw out something potential, to persuade, to feel, to believe, and act in a desired way, and may or may not include training. In other words, does not have to be. I mean, as you know, uh, Socrates or uh, the other ancient Greek uh, educators necessarily did not do any training. They just supervised practice. But to develop mentally, morally, and aesthetically is really the, the key for, for education. And uh, basically, when you put your life on the line and when you invest in the lives of people, that's what I call education. But then there's education is under attack. Here is what I just recently found. You can get an MBA after reading a book for $10. It says, recent example, it says, what is the essence of higher education is gathering useful information 
And therefore, how many employ employers will pay $120,000 a year to a person who read a book? And so here is the, the attack. The attack is that we have so much information out there that the collection of information that you can get on your smartphone is going to be a substitute. Who's going to believe this? So they keep selling this thing. So then, then the idea is that the, one of the reasons we are losing a certain number of people to, to want to be educated is because they are prideful. They don't want a mentor. They are, just don't need a role model. I'm always smarter. This is my conclusion. So in other words, I see education under attack from society in general that because of the availability of information, basically said education is superfluous. It's really not needed because we have so much information. You have to be an idiot not to be able to wiki or Google something up, so therefore uh, you don't need an education. That's one. Secondly, the training issue. The training, which is many times confused with edu education, which actually means undergo instruction, discipline, or drill to act or to process or impart knowledge in a certain way to teach us to make fit, qualify, and proficient. It's more specific. I always say that training is basically giving someone the uh, ability to follow a recipe and cook the same meal over and over again, perfectly, I might say. Education is to have someone understand the fundamentals of how sour and sweet go together and write cookbooks, especially when you don't have all the resources available and you lost your recipe book. And that doesn't mean that somebody who's educated, a cook, a master cook, wasn't trained at a certain point in his, time, is his life, but he still has to do, the French cooking is the best because they learn to do something from nothing. And I think that's the main difference. So I see already two yawns, so I will go faster. So uh, let me just emphasize again that education is not training. And you can read for yourself as training may or may not be part of education. And that training is similar, again, cookbook. Application. So knowing how to weld made me a better professor. I think that's definitely true. It gave me a lot of self-confidence. I think that breaking away from recipe is very important in education. And as far as I'm concerned, I had 0% success rate in educating well-trained welders. I mean, I have a slide about my failures, but this is one of them. I tried in the last year, couple of year, many years to actually have people who came from, from uh, Voltec schools and had learned some things that they were so, so set about that they did not have an open mind to unlearn. So unlearning was very, very difficult for them. So I don't know how to do this better. Maybe I, it's my personality, but I had zero success, success rate to actually turning people who uh, were, were trained into educated welding engineer. So we have Q&A, and you can ask me about why did I fail, but I think that that is a failure from my part. So just to lighten up the atmosphere, this is another sketch of my wife's that actually she was looking at angels flying through a very defective weld that had a lot of cracks. And then my next uh, little title, it's about theory versus practice. How did I learn? This is very s small print, so you cannot read from the back. I apologize. Basically, I take TIG welding as one of my, uh, my, my babies, because I learned it when I was in, back in Romania in, nine, in 74. Then I learned it in Bucharest, 76, 80. In Israel, I worked in TIG welding. Then I qualified in the shipyard. Then as an Israeli military had forced me to qualify, and also this is aluminum, uh, actually DC, believe it or not, straight polarity under, with an automated system uh, for F-16 fuel tanks. Uh, then I think that the modification of submerged or buried Arctic, which actually burned my skin everywhere. Imagine that I had a, a 3 8 diameter electrode, average current was 1,000 amps and I had to push this thing slowly using the arc voltage controller into the pool, therefore displacing the molten material. Well, before I submerged it, I got all exposed. I had greens and pig skins, and I was red all over. So I think that I, I, I paid my dues in TIG welding. <laughs> uh, but it actually worked. Uh, then uh, worried, uh, worked on TIG and laser beam welding at US Steel. At Carnegie Mellon, I used it, and I, I still think demonstrated. So that's, by the way, a very bad weld, very mismatched weld in the corner. So I would, I've used TIG welding that I think I understand really well at all levels. So 
Then I looked at TIG welding and I tried to understand what the, 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 the practice that I learned uh, helped me understand the fundamentals, the improvements, the controllability. I think that the, the cold and hot wire addition, hybrid enhancement, polarity and wave of control made my projects and much more other things more relevant and interesting. Well, we do have an automated TIG machine, by the way, at, at the university. And we did some studies for Riva on oxygen control on the beach shape and ductility dip cracking on, on the Inconel 625 deposits on stainless steels. It was uh, a lot of things about polarity and waveform control. So I think that my practical experience really, really helped me become a better teacher and a better researcher in TIG area. So my point here is in this little subchapter of this lecture, which is getting boring because I already heard it. So. <laughs> Uh, is what I believe, interestingly enough, that it remains one of the best known welding process, but it is one of the best controlled welding process. So I, I learned that when you decouple the heat source from the, the filler metal addition, you simplify things. And then I learned that it's not only me who recognizes it, because in a recent visit to Riva in France, I found out that actually they do eight inch thick pressure vessels replacing submerged arc welding with TIG welding. It's a very narrow groove. They have a cold wire in the front, a hot wire in the back, TV cameras and monitors everywhere. But I, could, I would have never thought ever in my life that, that TIG welding, multi-pass TIG welding, the slow, the low penetration, the, all the th bad things we always said about TIG welding will actually be premier in, in welding nuclear uh, vessels in chromal steel welding. So, my point is that even though I know how to do it and I learn how to understand it better through my research and teaching, I was still surprised. So this is a, you know, I can use this subchapter in my talk to say this is a fascinating field. All kind of unexpected things can happen to you. So if you have the attitude that I already know it all, give me a break. You don't, because I was surprised. So I am surprised, what I believe. Okay, next chapter, almost done here. A little bit of clarification about engine versus engine technology. Before I went to Letourneau, I really had no idea what engine technology was. It turns out that it's actually a four-year degree and accredited by ABAT under the TAC or TAC. We just went through the accreditation process right now. And it actually fits kind of interestingly in the famous psycho babel Maslow hierarchy of needs pyramid. It basically says that you start with physiological safety, belongingness, esteem, and self actualization as a theory of human motivation back from 1943. I learned this in management school. So basically says that the more accomplished you are, you, you come to the top of this pyramid and I just basically translated to that, to a career in welding. So it, it, here, it, here's a welder at the bottom. That's, uh, that's at the physiological and psychological. Then comes safety or welding technician. Then welding engineer and then self-esteem as researcher and self-actualization as welding engine professor. I really feel, not that I arrived at the top of a pyramid, but it is it's simply, there's one person here in the room that I'm not gonna name that might come back to teach. And I really think that engineering professors basically en encompass all those. It doesn't mean that it's at the top of the pyramid, that it's superior to the welders, but it is a fulfillment, it is an incredible, thing and, and I think that if that incredible feeling of fulfillment can be transferred to the students, then they will come and join your program. So that's my opinion about welding engineering in terms of fulfillment in career in welding. So then how does engineering technology fit, fit into this? Well, it's somewhere in between the first and the second. So if I go back here, it will be between welding engineer, welding engineer, because it's, people think it's a welding technician, but in reality is welding engineering. It actually is a degree that you learn by doing much more. Um, you don't have to take that many uh, classes in, in, uh, in uh, sciences. And it's an incredible program that you all, all of you who are in Votech schools, I would encourage you very, very much to consider because uh, to my knowledge, Ohio State doesn't have one and we have one, so it had to be some self-promotion here. Uh, it's, it's an incredible safety net for those who are not that academically inclined, but they are extremely good in learning uh, by doing. 
Uh, in senior design this year, I have two engineering technologists leading teams of engineering students. Their ability to communicate, to manage teams. Uh, we would have lost all these kids because of academic uh, performance, or lack of it, rather. And it's a, I, I consider engine technology an incredible, incredible invention. It actually came out of Purdue, believe it or not. They don't even have this degree in Europe or in Asia that I know of. It came out of 1920s. And they actually can become uh, professional engineers. Instead of, uh, instead of taking uh, five years practice, they have to take 10 years to become to, take the, to, to become engineers in training. So they can, they can take the EIT or engineering training exam and they can become PEs and they can go to graduate school. One of my best friends at Ohio State in graduate school was an engineering technologist, Scott West, remember Scott? Was now at uh, Savannah River Nuclear and just brilliant kid and was a great friend and I never understood what engineering technology was until I met him. So please consider this in this uh, uh, mishmash of things that I tell you what I believe in, that engineering technology has its really, really important uh, role in engineering education, and the Ferris State people do a fantastic job at it. I love those guys. I mean, they are so focused, and they don't badmouth anybody. They do that thing so well. They don't try to place themselves in any other position or dimension than they are in. So uh, please remember the Ferris State, I, I strongly recommend for people. So if you, if you want to do uh, teaching by doing, engineering technology is the way to go, and it's a not a dumbed down version of engineering. Please understand. And, uh, and if you have an ideal team, you should have engineers, engineering technologists, technicians, operators, and all that. It's, 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 it's a match made in heaven. So let me touch then on this very sensitive subject of teaching versus research, because uh, since I'm passionate about research, this came up many, many times. And, uh, the uh, contradiction is that one myth is that teaching is fun, I'm sorry, research is fun and teaching is boring because you have to do it over and over again. Then on the other one is teaching can be fun but research is only a money making enterprise which I hear a lot from teaching institutions. Uh, researchers do not know how to teach. Teachers do not know how to perform research. All teaching is left to grad students. Teaching and research based institutions should be ranked differently and on and on publish or perish attitude, destroy the quality on teaching, and et cetera. So there are a lot of, lot of contradictions, and that, they are very well funded in many places that um, I just happen to know about several instances in which uh, when the, the research uh, funding was very, very uh, beneficial, universities withdrew their traditional funding, and they said, you're doing too well. And they withdrew the traditional, and when things were not doing so, well, they never returned that money. And so now people have to go and, and find research projects just to pay for the bills. And it became a, a pressure, a financial pressure or a, 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 an existence pressure. So there had been mistakes made in this area. I'm not, I'm not saying that they are not. But yet, philosophically, I don't think there is any contradiction between teaching and research. Uh, all, some of you might disagree. So uh, there's a program in Pittsburgh that Confucius said, Bong, and there's a boing, so I just made this up, by the way. Teaching is research, and research is teaching. And I have a graduate student from China who said that he could have said that. <laughs> he, 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 didn't, he, he didn't know too much, but he did have something to say, such as all teachers are students and all students are teachers. Well, that's close. Huh? Anyway, so here is the, so my, my take on it is that this is the sign on my door, except for my grandson's picture is, this is what I believe. You, the, 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 the word between them shouldn't be versus, against, or for, it is. Teaching is research and research is teaching. So what did I, what can I brag about? I think I did teach welding, process metallurgy, robotics at undergraduate level, arc physics, advanced and DE. I, I improved the curriculum constantly, passed several ABET accreditation visits, and some students are here knowing that we started the graduate program, I, I was the first chair of that, I'm very proud of that, and continuously integrated teaching and research. And for some reason, nobody found out that I'm not like, I don't know too much about pedagogical things and all that, and the students keep ranking me pretty well. So I think that I can say that I did well in teaching overall. And here are some of the floating angels in the pictures. 
But I also was able to be fairly successful in research. What I call political metallurgy is one of the things that uh, was a joke that we learned at Ohio State when you know you study chemical metallurgy, mechanical metallurgy, and uh, all that, so political metallurgy. Uh, you have to do an awful lot of political metallurgy. Uh, Four and a half million dollars in funding, about 175 students, you can read for yourself. I didn't publish enough papers, I just never found the time to write enough, but I t gave a lot of talks. And I think that I did make contributions to certain things in uh, right now, uh, a patent apply for microwave welding. And uh, here is the final one, but some people might take offense at that, is that I think that in 16, 17 years, I closely mentored about 20 students. Uh, because I think that you can't really develop a, a, a real mentor-mentor relationship with more than one or two students in a year. Although we have kind of deceived ourselves that we have so many relationships in reality. You really, really, really mentor very few. Uh, but that's still better than nothing. I think that it was worth uh, going to teach. If I made a difference in the lives of 20 people, that's already a good thing. And if I underestimated that, it's always better than overestimating it. So, almost done. What I believe, teaching feeds on new research, therefore research cannot exist without good teaching. If you have good funding and spending policies, the real contradiction can be eliminated. Because I was part of the starting the master's program, we have a tuition waiver program, a research uh, overhead program that actually does not allow, at least under the current administration, to take away any kind of a tuition support from the department, in our case, the School of Engineering. So, Unless somebody comes and messes it up, which a new president could mess it up, right now we have a financial arrangement in place that would allow us not to get into that contradiction. Uh, again, it needs a lot of politicking, administration buy-in, and policies and attitudes have to be properly coordinated and communicated. I have to say that being a small institution and private institution, I was able to do that much better than if I were to be at a larger institution. The larger institution didn't want me anyway, so what can I say? I'm just, I'm just kidding. All right, in conclusion, and I know you're happy because I finished earlier, I, do, I did identify several contradictions and attempted to be part of solution. You didn't hear me complain too much today. I was tempted to complain a lot, but I didn't. I hope you would notice that. <laughs> uh, I also would like to leave a legacy, the legacy of value added uh, to industry. Uh, I, I don't know uh, how people are going to remember me, but be, be, this being such an uh, important and honorable award, I thought that I would like to leave some sort of value added legacy and to make myself edu uh, you know, available to educators, trainers alike. And this is my ultimate ambition to continue the RPI OSU Laterno legacy, going from back to Professor Savage through Baselak and Lippold and then Kilhorn to create the new one under my name. So that might sound too ambitious, but I, I, really, I really feel that the, the, the legacy of a continuity is a very important one. And I know this is kind of, I have to finish on a high note, but I, I have to confess one of my failures is that uh, one of the new fellows, I'm not going to say who, failed the qualifier exam for the PhD on the Black Tuesday on the same day with me. And one more person, John is laughing, he remembers. We were the first ones, nobody knew how to do a qualifier exam at Ohio State. So I got into a big argument with Professor Richardson. So they said, you failed. They said, well, then I'm going home. They said, no, you have to do this again. I said, well, then I passed. No, you didn't. You have to do this again. It's, a, it's an exercise in humility. So then John took his time. His, he, he took time from his lunch. And I, I was going to say this anyway, because Bazelak and you, you took time out of lunch and say, OK, let's rehearse constitutional equation. I still remember that. We have to do this constitutional equation. Bazelak was eating his peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you were saying, OK, what happens at point A, B, and you exceed the solubility? Come down, heat it up, cool it. And they drilled me into the ground. And they, then uh, Bazelak said, have no, no quarrels about this. You will have to be a clone in a good way, an Ohio State clone, pretty much like as we are, RPI, Professor Savage's clones. We don't like to say that because has 
bad connotations, but your students are your clones eventually. And so I, I, when I accepted that, the moment I accepted that, uh, I passed the qualifier with the flying colors, no arguments, smiling, everything was fine. And then what happened was that a couple, what, maybe five years ago, Dr. Bazelak came to Letourneau to give a talk. And some students never, never saw him before. And he gives this talk about titanium aluminides and all these incredibly complicated things. And the kids are laughing. And I go like, you know me. <laughs> I go like, I stop the talk. I go like, what's going on here? You know, this, this is what kind of disrespect. And then one of the students stood up and said, Professor Bazelak, and you lecture the same way, have the same demeanor, you have the, the jokes. In, in. And they were laughing to see that I was the real clone of Dr. Bazelak. So I'm proud of that. You know, it was, it was funny that they noticed it without even noticing. But, but there is there's, there's something very charming about that, to become someone's clone whom you respect, and you have all the reasons to follow in their footsteps. So with all that, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>